<laughs> it should just be the tip of it. It should come off maybe something. Just like bend it. <laughs> Is it coming off easily? <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Yes. <laughs> Are you on? Yeah, I'm on. Yeah. I'm streaming on Facebook uh, and YouTube, and soon I'll be streaming on Instagram as well. <laughs> this is going to be such a millennial thing. <laughs> did she find it? Uh, yeah, she did. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want it to be right here on this table or do you want me to hold it back there so we can see the whole um, are you using the board and stuff? It's gonna be when this comes down, which actually that's something you should figure out. Because I could do it right I could put it like right here. And sure the very last want. thing that I haven't figured out yet is how to actually make these come down. Um, I'm used to having to be buttons <laughs> right by this. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It's it's not not that <laughs> you press all these to like this. Yes. Torch. And if there's not two switches, <laughs> well, I have no idea. I've never been in this room. Yeah. And the projector is there, so I'm kind of guessing we'll be the other one. Yeah. Oh! oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's not. Okay, great. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Do you want me to? Oh, yeah, you can start now. Uh, yeah. So, George, is it helpful to get the whole picture by doing a video here? Oh, um, I'm just going to move the desk over, and that should be fine enough. Um, actually, yeah, no, I'm going to move it up again. Hey guys, does anyone know how to switch this to the center? Uh, I usually have to use the PC. And that should be. Where are you going to stand? I'm going to stand far to the left of it, I guess. That's good. Actually. Yeah. This, is for my, this is for the defense portion. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Right now, I'm just presenting. I'm not being attacked so far. <laughs> when people start shooting out, yeah. Things to, yeah. they can get bloody. Okay. So we'll keep it here and project strength. Yeah. Let's see, actually, I might have a bit of So you could, I think, if you wanted to, take this over there. Oh, yeah. Now that we're in the middle of 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 the um, there's a few more things I want to try and do. Uh, sorry, Michaela, where are you sitting? Uh, right in front of the computer. Great. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, and the last thing is to try and get the snowball it. Hello, boop, 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 boop. Okay, so I've got some audio. Hey, I got people uh, chiming in. I got two audio so far. <laughs> Thank you, friends. <laughs> oh boy, you guys, I'm viral. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna give this just two minutes trying to hook the audio up. If, if that doesn't work, I'm just gonna go straight to the actual presentation since that's what most people here care about more than this, I imagine. <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry, one more thing. I made a little cheat sheet that has um, references of the words I'm talking about. So if you want to take these and pass them around, 
to be in the view of anything I'm talking about at any point during the day. Um, just look back at that, and maybe that can help. This is one of the weird things of being in an apartment that is a mixed, uh, rather than just atmospheric science, is that people who are not um, scientists might know just as much about my research as people who are scientists. So, um, yeah. Do we know if we start at 2 or at 2.10? Um, you can uh, start at 2. I believe that I... You have to wait a little while because I don't see the entire committee. Okay. Hey, um, people... Okay, yeah, wait. I was going to check. Hey, people on live chat, can you hear me? Give me a uh, comment if you can hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Okay, yeah, all right. Um, uh, people hear me very well. Great. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. And, uh, this is uh, for the defense portion. <laughs> Here, let me get my George. Oh, you look like you're from Syria. Okay, um, I guess finally, this is not a good lighting for my presentation. You so, look good if that front light was off. Yeah, I've got a pair of the closest to. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. Okay, yeah. Is this good mood lighting for everybody? Sweet. Um, in my case, I think that considering the ridiculous amount of setup that I've pulled together, um, I'm ready to begin. Hey, okay, I'm going to introduce you. Okay, all oh, right. Thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah, you should probably do <laughs> So I think the entire committee is here and everyone else too, so I think we can start. Uh, let me let me get on, on Facebook live stream here. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to um, introduce to all of you, and of course everyone knows him already, George Duffy, who is going to defend his PhD today. Um, George came here, I believe, two and a half years ago with a master's degree in atmospheric sciences from the University of Illinois, and before that he did a bachelor's degree in math. Um, George has been a fantastic addition to the department, as probably everyone can attest to, and um, he has made fantastic research progress over the last two and a half years. And I think that is all I need to say, and I give the podium to George. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, it really means a lot. Um, I uh, was going to do one last adjustment. Um, so uh, the title of my presentation, uh, Satellite Measurements of Falling Snow, Methods and Applications. Um, I, uh, I am George Duffy, and uh, just a quick shout out to my advisors from Urbana Champagne, who are not here today, um, Greg McFarquhar and Steve Nesbitt. Uh, without them, I uh, would not be on this path today. Uh, now the title of my talk, is also my outline. Oh, whoops. I guess I'm not seeing my uh, thing anymore. Lydia, how do I get to present on how to? Okay, I'm gonna be bouncing back and forth a lot, uh, apparently. Um, actually, can, can somebody uh, go on that one? Just I can call out like a next whenever I want the next slide. Thanks, I appreciate that. So um, satellite measurements of falling snow is going to be the first portion. It's just an introduction that's going to tell you what my research is on. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. And what do I push? Uh, space bar. Um, then um, after that, I'm going to talk about the portion of my research that deals with methods. And finally, um, the next phase of my research uh, deals with applications. Um, and this is all going to make sense more as I go through my talk. But first, uh, we um, talk about uh, the question, what is falling snow, since this is uh, what my research is about. But a good way to understand what I'm working on is to ask, what is not falling snow? Um, so uh, to go through this, I have got uh, just a pretty simple cartoon. And um, this cartoon uh, shows the life cycle of clouds and snow. That's from little baby aerosols that get sucked up into a cloud 
They gain liquid water, uh, and then they freeze. And all the while, they're being blown up into the air until they start to get heavy enough to fall out where they grow some more. And then they start to get those really beautiful six-sided star shapes uh, until finally they fall out of the sky. Um, now, the first step of this process are particles I refer to as cloud ice. And uh, cloud ice is something I define as ice particles, which are not large enough to fall out of the cloud. Now, cloud ice is really important, and there's a lot of members of our group who just focus on cloud ice, but that's not my research. Um, now, the next uh, thing, and this is the snow that most of you probably think of when you think of snow, is accumulated snow. And accumulated snow is fantastic. Accumulated snow is what gets us out of school. It provides fresh water for a billion people across the planet. And it's also um, actually a health hazard because it can cause heart attacks for people who are shoveling. And it's also just a leading cause of stupidity for young college kids. Um, <laughs> but again, uh, this is not what I study. Um, I study falling snow. And so uh, I define falling snow as um, ice crystals and clouds that are large enough to fall out um, basically as precipitation. Their force of gravity exceeds the lift force from the wind in the cloud. So uh, this is all good and great, but why do I care about falling snow? Uh, these are particles that are kind of the shortest live of all ice in the sky. The instant it starts to fall, it's only going to be there for a few minutes before it hits the ground, um, and that's when it typically matters. So why do I care? Well, uh, there's a bunch of answers I can give, but I think this really sums it up. Um, when you uh, think of a rainstorm, uh, if you look up in the clouds beyond where the rain starts, that is more often than not actually a snowstorm. I like to think of snow as the teenage years of precipitation. And so um, this is just a graph of um, the fraction of rain events from melting snow. This just means how often during snowstorms do they actually start as rainstorms. It was put together by a paper from a field in Hinesfield. And um, you can see that uh, over North America and over Siberia, most of our rainstorms are actually melted snowstorms. And uh, that might not be as surprising as the fact that it's also that way over Africa and Australia. Very decidedly not uh, cold and snowy places. Now, um, this is uh, places where um, there's a lot of thunderstorms. And if uh, many of you aren't aware, uh, lightning and thunder are actually created by atmospheric um, ice and snow particles. And so these places that have uh, lots of cloud ice, um, they are, there's places that are very warm, but they also have important snow and grapple processes that are responsible for their rain. So this is one, probably the principal reason that I'm really interested in falling snow. Um, now, how do I measure falling snow? And this is going to be tricky for you, Sarah Jane, but I think it's built into it. Um, this is my this is a satellite, and let's say that it's orbiting over, and we're able to freeze it in time. Obviously, a satellite is going to stay in motion, but this is just for a picture of um, representation. And what it's going to do is it's going to shoot out something called a radar pulse. Now, this is something that I've listed in that handout. A radar pulse is just a vibration of electromagnetic energy at a long wavelength. Light is uh, um, electromagnetic energy. Um, this is a microwave wavelength. So this radar pulse is going to fly through the cloud. And as it goes through the cloud, it's actually going to hit every single piece of ice in the cloud. And then something really cool happens. Um, almost like tiny little mirrors, every single snow particle emits its own microwave um, back at the snowflake. And these, um, you can think of them as echoes. And the combination of every one of these echoes from all of the snowflakes is what we refer to as reflectivity. And this is what um, radars measure. Radar is a tool that measures reflectivity. Uh, so then the reflectivity of the cloud flies all the way through space, and then it hits uh, the orbiting satellite radar, and then the uh, satellite goes on its merry way. Um, so again, reflectivity might not be the most common uh, term, um, but I promise you've seen it all before. Um, every time you look at a local weather radar map, uh, my stepmother would always refer to really heavy stuff as um, stories of her mother saying, red rain, red rain. Uh, but those colors of like heavy precipitation, uh, that is reflectivity. Um, this green and yellow are just different representations of radar reflectivity. The newscasters just don't tell you because they don't think you're smart enough to understand, but I promise you are. Um, <laughs> 
So uh, I think that's, uh, um, so that is everything with the background. I hope you understand that I care about measuring falling snow because it's really important to the precipitation life cycle. And that since I want to measure it across the entire planet, I like to use satellites, uh, which are global measurements. So now the next part of my talk is uh, what I refer to as methods. This is my research into how to measure snow properties from satellite radars. Because like I said, uh, satellites measure reflectivity, but I don't think anybody's ever cared about how bright is the snow today and what's the reflectivity of those clouds over there. We want to know the snowfall rate or the density of clouds, or in my case, the size of snowflakes. So uh, for this portion, we're going to be focusing on a satellite called Global Precipitation Measurements, or GPM. Now, uh, GPM is a, a really cool radar. It was launched um, just a few years ago, and uh, not just a few years ago, but within the decade. Um, and what's really special about GPM is it carries not one and not three, but two radars. Um, <laughs> But uh, that does make it the most radars of any uh, currently orbiting satellite radar. Um, the KU band radar has a 22 millimeter wavelength, and the KA band radar has an 8 millimeter wavelength. And these differences in wavelength are important. And if you are confused by wavelength, I'll try to include a picture of that in the handout. Um, but the uh, basics is that for snowflakes, um, a larger wavelength uh, will tend to mean a larger reflectivity. And the difference between um, reflectivities at KU band and KA band can be measured by something called the DWR, which I know that a lot of you aren't math heavy, but I promise this is just a pretty simple equation. It is just the reflectivity at KU band minus reflectivity at KA band. And what's really interesting is that as you get larger snowflakes, the difference between KU reflectivity and KA reflectivity will grow. And so um, uh, we hypothesize that you can use this measurement, the DWR, the dual wavelength ratio, um, as a measure of snow particle size in clouds. Uh, so now just to show you what this looks like, um, I, uh, earlier I said that we've all seen uh, reflectivity. But those are kind of horizontal from uh, radars that start on the ground in this scan in a circle. My satellite, they're going from the sky and so you get these altitude uh, structures of reflectivity. And so this allows us to basically see the structure of the storm. And you get these really nifty features. You get this cool curved region of high reflectivity um, and uh, these uh, towers of larger um, reflectivity. Um, now again, you see I'm referring to this as reflectivity and that's because I can't directly say yet what reflectivity refers to in terms of large mass or large particles. But um, if I look at it at Ke reflectivity, which is on top, and Ka reflectivity, which is in the middle, you can start to see differences between these two uh, radar measurements, uh, principally between 15.9 and 16 hours. Um, and uh, so on the bottom, again, DWR is just the difference between the reflectivities uh, in decibel scales. And these regions that are different just really pop out. Um, and now this is something that kind of uh, sparks some curiosity in a scientist. Uh, why is this region over there um, so bright in such a weird shape? Um, is there anything in common with these regions down below that are also bright, or is it a different phenomenon? And uh, this is uh, kind of my research. Um, and so, uh, like I said, I'm interested in, uh, I uh, hypothesize that Mainly, DWR is going to be responsible for the size of frozen snowflakes. Now, that's kind of a nebulous term, size. Um, and so to make it more specific, uh, there is this one metric called the mass-weighted mean diameter, um, or DM, is what I'm going to be referring to it in uh, graphs. Now, mean is a scientific word for average. And when I say mass-weighted, um, the reason is that if you just grab like a big bottle of cloud particles, most of them are gonna be very, 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 very small. And they're not the stuff that I care about because they're more cloud particles. And so if we, if I say this is a bottle of snowflakes, um, the size of an average snowflake might be this tiny thing right down there, which will never even fall out. Um, but when you do a weighted average, uh, this allows us to focus more on the heavier particles that we care about. 
So the mass weighted mean diameter is, uh, I think, the diameter of the snowflake that has an average mass in a cloud sample. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, this gives us something which I refer to as the DWR-DM relationship. Again, that's the dual wavelength ratio that's measured by the satellite, DM, mass weighted mean diameter relationship. And uh, in this plot over here, I have simulated um, this relationship. I uh, simulate the radar echo from simulated snowflakes, and I compare it with the mass weighted mean diameter from that same group of snowflakes. And uh, first, I yes, I get a relationship, but then there's actually something really interesting uh, that comes out of this graph. I use three different models to represent snowflakes. I use uh, something called a spheroid, which you can just think of one of those French beanie hats, um, or a flying saucer. Uh, I use a dendrite aggregate, and those are just those picturesque snowflakes, but this is a very finely resolved model, and a needle aggregate, which, as it sounds like, is just a bunch of needles clumped together. Um, these all have very different shapes, and you might think that the relationship would be different for different shapes, as they are actually with single wavelength reflectivity. Um, but you can see that the DWR to DM relationship is very consistent when you have different shapes of snowflakes. And this is really powerful because if you have a satellite that is orbiting the entire planet, it's going to be measuring clouds that are wet, it's going to be measuring clouds that are over mountains, it's going to be measuring clouds that are above thunderstorms, and each of these clouds is going to have a different kind of snowflake associated with it. But apparently, if this DWR method um, is relatively uh, consistent between all these environments, then we can just apply a single algorithm to the satellite and get retrievals across the entire planet, which would be fantastic. Um, but so far, before my research, um, this had really only been done in simulations. And so um, the point of my research, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so I'll just this last slide about simulations. Um, GPM uh, measures reflectivity, uh, but the NASA Processing Center, um, they provide um, variables to the public. And so they actually have an algorithm that takes these reflectivities and outputs um, mass weighted mean diameter. But uh, they have a rather peculiar algorithm. Uh, they have one single relationship, just like I showed you earlier, that is above rainstorms. But uh, for clouds that are above snowstorms, um, it has a different uh, temperature-dependent relationship. And so what this means is that if you have, uh, let's say there's a cloud at negative 5 degrees Celsius. Um, in a rain cloud, it might be right above the melting layer. Uh, a DWR of 5 decibels would correlate to or correspond to a 1 millimeter um, uh, DM for a size distribution. But above a snow cloud, that same DWR would register at almost twice the size of the particles. And so this now gives us a testable hypothesis. If we measure snow clouds and rain clouds, are we going to get this difference of particle size associated with DWR? Um, great. OK, so now I can go to my research questions. Um, so now there's three um, questions that I'm interested in for this section. First, uh, what is the relationship between DWR and DM in clouds? Uh, these were all simulated, but what, what if we could measure it? Second, oh, whoops, uh, actually, uh, whatever, I'll, I'll say second, um, does DWR to DM relationship, um, is it an improvement over a uh, single wavelength reflectivity, since previous radars have only been able to do that? And finally, um, how well are they, uh, actually, re I repeat all the questions in a second, so let's do it then. Um, the uh, first, uh, I'm going to go through the data that I'll be using. Um, and these are actual uh, genuine satellite data. This is what the um, GPM satellite measures from storms. Um, this is dual wavelength reflectivity over a rainstorm and a snowstorm. And these are the sample cases I'll be using for this presentation. And some of you might notice that this is not as refined as the previous radar images I showed from an airplane. But give them a break. This is going through space. Um, that's really impressive. Um, Next is the data itself. And so I use a series of experiments. Um, and what they all have is something called co-located measurements. These co-located measurements take an airplane radar, which is flying above clouds, and something called an in situ aircraft. That is a fancy Latin term that just means inside of clouds. Um, and uh, any time that the radar and the in situ aircraft are measuring the same volume of snowflakes, we get a co-located measurement. And so what I made here is a graph, and this shows the flight path of an airplane radar, an in-situ cloud, 
And in red, I've highlighted all of the regions that I was able to identify as co-locator measurements. And from there, it can become a sort of apples-to-apples -apples method, where um, if our simulation says that a DWR of two decibels should equal a DM of one millimeter, but um, the actual measurement shows a DM of 1.5 millimeters, then we know there's something wrong. Um, so this is an example of what happened after I uh, just developed some code to identify the different regions. And up top, I have the uh, DWR reflectivity from one flight day, and I have the airplane flight path highlighted in front of it. On the bottom, I've just got a dual plot, and this shows the DWR, again, that is the dual wavelength reflectivity um, measured by the radar, um, and the DM, again, this is the mass weighted mean diameter or the average size of the snowflakes, um, at every, and they're uh, on the same time series. And now we can already see there is some early agreement from my hypothesis. Um, as DM goes up, so does DWR. As DM goes down, so does DWR. It seems like we have a good correlation between the observations. So now we're ready for science. Um, my first research question, uh, what is the relationship between DWR and DM in clouds? Uh, so just uh, a couple of graphs here. Um, I have combined all the data from all of my experiments together um, and uh, made these two plots. On the right, we have the mass weighted mean diameter, and on the, sorry, the y axis, and then on the x axis, um, we have the DWR in this graph, and ZKU, that is single wavelength reflectivity. Now, one thing I'm not sure I mentioned before is that there have been previous, there are other satellites that measure mass weighted mean diameter, and they're all limited to single wavelength reflectivity. So, part of the goal of this research is to kind of show the improvements that can come from dual wavelength reflectivity not only for current satellites, but um, for future satellites that might be planned, whether we might want to use this capability. And uh, so I do find this consistent relationship um, with a correlation coefficients of 0 0.77. And I'm using a rank correlation coefficients as opposed to uh, the linear correlation coefficients that might be more familiar. And that's because um, these, aren't, uh, total, these aren't expected to be linear relationships. Um, and now in this single wave, uh, this other figure, I just did a uh, single wavelength reflectivity. And this, the, the main reason I showed that there is for contrast, and we can see that, yes, um, the DWR-DM relationship is representing a more correlated relationship um, than the single wavelength reflectivity. Good job, DPR. Um, uh, second question. Um, and that, so that was for all data put together. Now I'm interested in consistency. Does DWR provide a more consistent retrieval of DM than single wavelength reflectivity in different environments? So I use those same different clouds from GPM, uh, different environments, but I added one more distinction of temperature is colder than negative 20 degrees and temperature is warmer than 20 degrees. Oh, that. Um, <laughs> and this is because uh, these different environments have two principal different snowflake types. You have the, um, there's larger particles that are expected in um, warmer clouds. And also because I found this really neat relationship uh, that wasn't expected, and I'm probably gonna hope to research more, which is that uh, when I grouped the single wavelength reflectivities together in these ways, I also got these very distinct different um, D to, uh, Z to DM relationships. Um, the, you can see that it's most correlated in snowing clouds. In fact, the rank correlation coefficient is about as strong as the uh, DWR to DM relationship for the entire cloud set. And again, in these um, warm, warmer raining clouds, uh, warmer than negative 20 degrees Celsius, we also have a relationship uh, that has a stronger correlation coefficient. And then in colder raining clouds, the relationship's kind of a mess. Um, there's not, this is not the focus of my research, but this is more to provide contrast, but this is a really cool result that I'm really excited about. Um, more importantly, uh, this is the DWR to DM relationships in those same three environments. And uh, they actually all look pretty similar. They all have strong correlation coefficients. Um, there is a deviation to lower mass weighted mean diameters uh, for these raining clouds. Oh, one thing I'm not sure I mentioned, I'm sorry. Uh, each of these different colors represents a different flight day. I uh, removed the information of my experiments, but I used three experiments and nine flight days from these experiments. And so each of these colors just represents a different storm. And so when I'm looking at consistency, it's, um, I'm happy to see that the relationships are consistent between different storms, which might contain different snowflakes. 
Um, so we can do a more direct comparison in this final set of figures. Um, here I have just got those empirical relationships between reflectivity and DM. Um, on the right, I have all the single wavelength retrievals, and on the left, I have all the dual wavelength, the DWR. And now we can very clearly see that in all manner of raining and snowing and warm and cold clouds, uh, that DWR to DM relationship is not only strong, it is consistent. Um, whereas the single wavelength method that is used by uh, CloudSat and Trim um, and uh, alternate methods, GPM, um, you get different relationships in different kinds of clouds. And that's the kind of thing that is not ideal for a satellite measurement, because you might have to try and be picky and apply a different relationship in different environments, or recognize you're going to have biased measurements in different parts of the planet. So finally, um, are GPM, are these algorithms, uh, are, are these um, differences, uh, sorry, are GPM algorithms providing reliable, um, reliable retrievals of DM? Now I'm going to compare my methods with um, the methods that NASA has developed. So uh, first, um, I uh, am analyzing that rainstorm. Again, this is that same uh, figure I showed before. This is the DWR measurements of a rainstorm from uh, GPM. Um, now in the middle, I have applied that uh, relationship that I said that NASA uses um, to convert uh, DM from a DWR measurement. And we get, uh, so uh, also in these figures, only look at um, measurements above the zero degree measurements. That's because anything that is warmer than zero degrees is rain, that is outside of my purview, it's not my job, so I'm not going to do a good job there. Um, <laughs> But we can see that uh, in both the cases, um, the empirical retrieval is my method. Empirical just means a relationship that's drawn from experimental observations, as in measurements in clouds rather than simulations. Um, but we can see that both of us seem to agree it, uh, the snowflakes in the cloud have an average size between around 1.5 millimeters, uh, give or take a few tenths of a millimeter. Um, but now we go to these uh, snow clouds, and this is where my relationship really differs from the NASA assumption. You see, I have that exact same relationship as before, and I do not show any differences with temperature. Um, NASA has this uh, relationship that in these clouds, uh, mainly between negative 10 and negative 20, um, you're going to have this much higher um, retrieval error mass rate in diameter. And so now uh, the two of us um, just disagree pretty well. Uh, we say that from a cloud that has a DWR of around two decibels, I predict a um, mass weight of mean diameter of 0 0.5 millimeters, whereas the NASA algorithms uh, assume, again, um, around 1.5 millimeters. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is that uh, the NASA algorithms are now assuming that this snow cloud has the same size snowflakes as the um, rain cloud I was showing you previously that had a DWR that was double or triple uh, the values of the snow cloud. And again, um, since this is based off of multiple um, measured environments, I do believe the empirical relationships are more trustworthy. So finally, um, I just did a direct comparison where I subtracted um, the mass weighted mean diameter from the NASA retrieval and from the empirical method. And we can see that in rain clouds, there is still a slight bias, but this is something that is not too concerning. It's pretty close to zero. But we are getting a strong disagreement in snow clouds that changes um, with uh, temperature, which again is to be expected because they have a temperature dependent uh, assumption, and I do not. Um, and so this is something that uh, caused me to have some concern about the uh, GPM uh, retrievals for snowfall because there are papers they are using those measurements uh, for um, average snowflake sizes. But um, whereas this empirical retrieval is based on experimental data that were actually uh, NASA sponsored, the uh, assumptions that are being used um, in the algorithm are uh, just mostly based off of uh, pretty basic snowflake assumptions. And so this is something that I'm hoping to talk to them more about uh, when I get a chance to visit in a month. Um, but that is the end of my study. Um, First of all, uh, the question, what is the relationship between blank, that was a DWR, and DM in clouds? Um, it agrees with simulated predictions. Um, second, does DWR provide a more consistent retrieval of DM than single wavelength reflectivity? Yes. Um, and finally, um, are these retrievals from the GPM satellite uh, reliable? 
And um, I said that for our rainstorms, it looks like they're agreeing with our experimental predictions. But in snowstorms, uh, it, they disagree with my predictions, and they also don't make sense compared with other um, NASA retrievals. And so I think that more studies should be going into uh, the assumptions that are being carried by NASA snowstorm retrievals. And I am exactly at 30 minutes, considering this is two thirds of my talk, so I'm really uh, excited about that. Um, finally, uh, applications. Um, the impact of melting snow uh, on the ocean surface heat budget. The, but the purpose of this talk is that I have um, been spending the previous time just uh, showing how to measure snow. And I said that it could be broadly important, but uh, I wanted to give you a specific example of why melting snow is an important, why falling snow is important to measure. And that's what this study is gonna be. But first, uh, the ocean surface heat budget. What's that? Um, I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, but first, uh, just some make some out terms, which again, I added these on the cheat sheet just um, a few minutes ago, so hopefully it's spelled right. But uh, there's a variable that we call Q. Q is a heat flow. Um, that is a transfer of uh, energy. Um, you get a heat flow when you walk outside in a warm day or a cold day, because um, it doesn't matter. Uh, it tech, heat always goes from uh, hot to cold, but um, a transfer of energy is all that matters for my discussion. And when I say Q net, um, that is the sum of all heat flows, because you can be heated in multiple different ways. And I'm going to walk you through all the different ways that the ocean can be heated over the next few slides. The first is uh, what we refer to as sensible heating. This is the direct transfer um, of heat from uh, one object to another. So um, if you jump into a cold body of water, like this unfortunate fellow, um, there will be a sensible heat transfer from your warm uh, body into the colder um, uh, ocean water. The second is the uh, vapor, the evaporative heat transfer. Again, this is something we are all familiar with. Um, if we are outside on a hot day and we sweat, as our sweat dries, um, that will cool us off. Uh, that is a uh, good job evolution. Um, there's also, and also uh, if we have hot soup or hot tea and we wanna blow on it to cool it down, we are evaporating um, the top layers of it to try and cool it off. Um, now something that many people might not be as familiar with and the picture might not be as helpful. But this is something called a uh, long wave radiation. You are all emitting long wave radiation right now. Um, long wave radiation, that chair is emitting long wave radiation, that clock is emitting long wave radiation. All matter is constantly emitting um, radiation and because of that, all matter is always, it's all cooling down and trying to collaborate with the universe. Um, at that same token, we are all being warmed by radiation from all of us, we are all connected our long wave radiations. Um, this is, a, it is a sort of a balance. And so since the ocean is always losing energy from long wave radiation, um, that is uh, typically a cooling effect. But because clouds and the air overhead are also emitting long wave radiation back into the ocean, um, it becomes a more complicated calculation. But this can be very strong. Uh, short wave radiation. Uh, we, sort of, we say long wave and short wave because if you look at that, um, the handout, there's different wavelengths associated with different kinds of uh, radiation. We emit microwaves, but um, the sun emits visible light, which is much, much smaller wavelengths. And we all know that uh, the sun can heat us up um, because if you stay outside uh, too long near the pool, uh, you're gonna get hurt. Um, and if you step outside on a sunny day, you just feel really nice. Um, the sun heats up the ocean a lot. So these four are kind of the traditional um, heat flows into the ocean. If you look up any uh, most um, papers that try to calculate the future heat budgets of the ocean, they'll just give you those four. But in certain places, um, there is ice in the water. And everybody here who has ever uh, got a cup of water and thought, oh, I don't like this, it's too mild temperature, I only like cold water, and got a cup of ice water and put it in there, um, knows that melting ice can uh, cool the temperature of water. Um, and uh, now I want you to imagine um, all the snow that you see pile on roads in Alaska or if you're one of it in Tennessee, we don't get that much snow. But I'm sure you've seen pictures or maybe you ski down mountain slopes where snow can just pile up feet and meters high. 
Uh, and just imagine all of that snow that might fall in a season um, being combined into a single ice cube. That is a lot of cooling energy. And that was kind of uh, one of the first questions I have when I started doing research here is, can that cooling energy um, cool the ocean in a way that's important for climate calculations? So those are my research questions. Um, and I broke it into two parts uh, because um, we know that when it's not snowing, then the melting snow heat flux is gonna be zero because there's no ice in the ocean. Um, so this gives us two cases. First of all, during snowstorms, is uh, the heat flux of snow important? That means that when there is always this term. And then the big picture, if we take the average of all the times when it snows and when it doesn't snow and just average all that um, time together, um, is melting snow something that we should be including in our heat flux calculations? Is it important? Um, because, you know, uh, technically I can say that I can throw an ice cube in the ocean and say that there's a melting um, ice term, but that's not going to uh, save the planet. Um, <laughs> So uh, for this, I'm using a different satellite. Um, I'm using uh, CloudSat. Um, now, one of the reasons I'm using CloudSat is that CloudSat has an 82 degrees maximum latitude, and GPM has a 65 degree maximum latitude. And if I'm trying to measure snowfall, and GPM has a 65 degree maximum latitude, can anybody here think of a part of the planet that I might be missing that I want to measure? <laughs> Just shout it out. <laughs> The poles, yes, where all the snow is falling. Um, so uh, I'm using CloudSat. Also, CloudSat's been around longer, and there's a more dedicated snowfall measurement, and it can measure more snow. A bunch of good reasons. Um, on the left, I've just made an example. This is a really beautiful, lovely snowstorm. These are called polar lows, or Arctic hurricanes. Um, and uh, they are basically snowstorms that form hurricane-like structures over the ocean. And this is a pass from CloudSat that got over the middle of it. And on the bottom, um, this is what a CloudSat radar measurement looks like. Um, and again, we can see the structure of the storm from the satellite radar measurements. But because these people at CloudSat have been working to develop um, retrieval algorithms for a while, we also have these snowfall rates that are at the surface of underneath every one of these radar measurements. Meaning that anywhere that I have a cloud set measurement, I also have a snowfall measurement. And actually, because uh, those people are really smart and have been doing a lot of work, um, I also have a latent heat flux. I also have a long wave radiation measurement, and I have a solar radiation, and I have every single thing that I need to measure the ocean surface heat flux just from this satellite and its friends. Um, whoops. <laughs> that was far. Um, but uh, when I want to get a uh, longer um, measurements, uh, CloudSat isn't going to cut it um, for two reasons. One, because it's orbiting the planet, and because unfortunately sometimes we live in a spherical planet, um, there is a much greater frequency of uh, measurements at the poles than there is um, once you get farther away. This is a paper uh, by Blarmi et al. Um, where he was trying to measure, use CloudSat to measure the amount of snow over Antarctica. And you can see that over a five-year period, uh, the, the frequency of the amount of measurements dropped from over 2,000 to um, just an, an order of magnitude, um, just over 300, meaning one measurement every few days um, over just uh, several degrees of latitude. Um, also, uh, it only goes back to 2006. Now, if I'm going to try and get a good climatology and understanding of uh, the average heat budget of the ocean, I want something that is globally uniform, and I want something that goes back as long as I can. There's something called reanalysis, which I doubt many people here have heard of before, um, unless you've heard one of my previous talks. But uh, if you think that every day um, there's a bunch of weather researchers and they run global weather models, uh, those models aren't thrown away. Um, we have an idea of where it's raining and where it's cloudy on the planet um, from these weather models, and we can just save an archive. And so you can just look back a year ago and say, what did the weather say was happening over the Arctic Ocean in January 12th, 2004? Um, so those, that's, some, that's the forecast part of reanalysis. But uh, weathermen and women are mercilessly mocked because uh, sometimes we might say that it's going to rain over Nashville, and then it might not rain. And that's something called an observation. With our own eyes or our own skin, we are not wet. 
And um, so then we are able to adjust those forecasts with um, measurements, not just from personal measurements, but from stations, from satellites, um, a whole bunch of measurements under the sun, and that gives us a reanalysis. And so together, a reanalysis model is basically our best available estimate of every single property of the planet, um, going back, in this case, to the 70s. This is my best method to understand the amount of snow that's falling um, in history. So research question number one, uh, does melting snow cool the ocean noticeably during snowstorms? Um, so this is just one example, but it's a really good example. Um, when I calculate all those heat fluxes on this graph, on the top part, I've got heat fluxes, on the bottom I have longitude. Um, snow melts, long wave, short wave, evaporation, sensible heating, uh, they all stay within 50 watts per meter squared. That's a, a, mesh, a unit of energy um, in density. Um, once we get to this region of higher reflectivity, meaning stronger snowfall, um, snow melts becomes the most powerful um, ocean heat flux contributor. It's not just significant, it is dominating. Um, so this is good, but what if this is just a one-off? Like if this happens every once in a while, it's not that important. But it's not just once in a while. Um, so what I have here is I took all of my snowstorm measurements over the cloud set period, and I ranked them. Um, and uh, First, you can see at the bottom that a lot of these are just really minuscule snowfall rates. These are in liquid equivalents, but still, uh, lots of you might be able to recognize if you walk outside on a winter day, a lot of times you'll see a few snowflakes falling here and there, and we might not consider that a storm. But CloudSat recognizes these all as snow events, so that's what these are talking about. And in 20% of snow events, um, and day and night, kind of separated because solar heating is really powerful. Um, melting snow is the most powerful um, heat flux into the ocean. Uh, so this means that if you're trying to understand the um, couple dynamics between the ocean and a storm, um, it is really important to account for uh, this melting snow term. Question two. Uh, does it play an important role in the Earth's ocean surface heat budget? This is the big question for climate. So um, what I did here, and that might not be as readable as I would like, um, but I used my reanalysis to average over 50-year periods um, in eight seasons. Um, we can ignore this bottom part. I probably should have cropped that out. Um, and uh, this color scale goes from 0 to 10. Anywhere you see blue, that means it's uh, negative 10 watts per meter squared. And anywhere you see red, that means it's 0 watts per meter squared. Um, so this is about a tenth of what we're seeing during the individual storms for maximum values. Um, and we see that, as we would expect, um, is, oh, and uh, these are different seasons. DJF, MAM, JJJ, SON, that is how meteorologists say winter, um, spring, summer, and autumn. Um, but in the southern hemisphere, they would be flipped, so we refer to them as these conventions instead but each of these letters refers to the months in the season. So if you forget what I'm talking about, and I say S-O-N, just think, oh right, September, October, November. Um, so these numbers aren't that useful on their own because we need, we're, I'm interested in the total surface heat budget. So when I um, compared it, this is just one month, but uh, in one month, October of 2009, I compared the heat flux from snow um, with the heat flux from long wave radiation, from latent cooling, from sensible cooling, and short wave heating. Um, now, note that all of these are in different color scales because, with the exception of snow, um, the uh, cooling flux from all these forces is much stronger um, than snow melt. And they combine to make something even stronger than snow melt. And so, this means that uh, taking that surface value, um, it might seem that actually snow melt is not that big of a deal, and so it's not something that we needed to consider um, in ocean models because it's just not making that big enough of an impact. But again, um, I'm really just interested in the total significance. So I can wash out that other stuff and um, really just try to compare the influence from snow and the total um, snow melt, uh, the total um, heat budget. Now, one important thing also is that the sun is heating the ocean while the other things are cooling the ocean, and the sun can be very strong. So in certain cases, you can imagine that if the two are near perfectly balanced, 
those one to five um, watts per meter squared from snow might suddenly start to make a bigger difference. So now my question becomes, how often is the ocean surface that well balanced that the smaller impact of snow makes a larger relative difference in the heat budget? Um, and actually, it happens uh, fairly often. Um, if we uh, look in the winter uh, months, it's not that big of a deal. But this is the same graph as before um, in terms of the uh, seasons and locations. Um, but I have this uh, metric that I should have defined better before. I just showed it, snowfall impact metric. That's basically just the fraction, the fraction of um, snow cooling over total heat budget. And um, I can see that snow accounts for up to a quarter of the uh, total surface heat budget um, in season, in, uh, specifically during these seasons where um, this is actually kind of important, but these are seasons where sea ice is growing or melting. And that is where it's really important to understand the heat flow in the ocean um, is that uh, uh, when um, heat flows in the ocean is how sea ice forms and breaks. And sea ice is one of the biggest issues of contemporary um, climate change research. Um, so in summary, uh, yes, melting snow is often the strongest cooling flow in the ocean. And um, does it play an important role in the ocean surface heat budget? Sometimes, some places, um, mainly in these transition seasons. Um, but it looks like this is something that if uh, climate models are not uh, taking into account when trying to forecast um, future sea ice models, um, that uh, they should. And I publish a paper to this effect. So this is just some next steps. I'm probably not going to spend too much time on this because I'm almost over. Um, but one cool thing that I found that I wasn't expecting was that when I used these different experiments, um, I uh, compared the DWR and the single wavelength reflectivity, and I found an unexpected measurement of uh, cloud density, or total water content. This is something I'm going to be exploring later uh, because this hasn't, I don't think this has been predicted yet. Um, I can also use these satellite measurements if I can retrieve total water content or ice water content, which I unhelpfully refer to as two different variables. And then I can start making climatologies where we can start to see interesting patterns. This is the average um, measurements taken in snow clouds at negative five degrees Celsius. What's going on? Why are the particles bigger um, to the east of the mountains and smaller to the west of the mountains? I don't know yet, um, but I've just got this one graph and I'd love to explore it more. Um, if I'm going to try and check out more melting snow, uh, Arctic hurricanes, which are wild and cool, are a really good target because Arctic hurricanes are fueled by the, by the temperature difference between the ocean and the sky. So if I've determined that melting snow is important for that temperature difference, it could be important for the development of these storms. And finally, um, as uh, the climate changes, that means the amount of snow that falls is going to change as well. And that means that the amount, the amount of melting snow in the sky is going to change. And so this actually might change the dynamic, the average dynamics of climate over land as well as the ocean. And I believe that's the end of my talk, my dissertation summary. Uh, Max of mean diameter can be reliably retrieved from DPM measurements with a single DWR DM relationship. Um, that my, the retrievals of DM agree with my predictions, but not above rain clouds, but not above snow clouds. And finally, um, the satellite and reanalysis estimates reveal that melting snow is an important component of the ocean surface budget. Thank you all very much. Um, so uh, there is a, uh, oh, we have one more actually, it's over. Um, and there was, yeah, and there's one piece of paper that I thought that I had somewhere. Um, but I can actually just look it up, I believe, on my computer, because I have something special to say. Um, and I was so special that I wrote it down. Um, <laughs> but it is just a piece of my story that I thought was important for people to know about, because it's a good advocacy thing. Um, and it actually, once I did more research, I thought it was really amazing when I learned more about it. Uh, but I have bipolar disorder, which I think that a lot of people here have talked to about. And a lot of people know it as a form of depression, but it's actually also a pretty major disability. Um, it is uh, one of the, um, I think the fifth uh, largest economic loss in terms of disabilities. Um, and a lot of people who have this disorder, uh, they can't live independently and they can't hold jobs, especially the kind of stuff that requires like real independence, like academia, um, independent motivation and collaboration. 
And uh, when I did some more research into it, I found that according to a survey conducted in 2003, 83% of people with bipolar disorder um, reported serious impairment from their condition. And all rem um, remaining people reported moderate impairment. Um, after that, I took that same survey and I, I was surprised to find that I barely registered as having any impairment. Um, so apparently, uh, due to a combination of modern medicine, uh, therapy, lifestyle choices, and a more progressive mental health culture, I am currently functioning at a level that would have been highly unlikely and possibly unheard of if I had been born just two decades ago. Uh, so in this way, I think this dissertation represents uh, not just my research, but I like to think that I am the end result of an army of psychologists and biologists and pharmaceutical professionals and psychiatrists who have all made it their life's work uh, to make a world where people like myself um, could pursue a scientific career uh, with safety and relative normalcy. Um, I am living the dreams of my childhood and I owe this possibility to them. Um, now I am also acutely aware that I represent an anomaly, uh, not just for bipolar sufferers, but also for people, um, not just in history, but also for um, bipolar sufferers in general. Uh, for the past 10 years, I have always been in a college that offered free mental health counseling, free psychiatric um, professionals. I have always had health care. And because of this, um, whereas the average time to diagnosis is five years, I got a diagnosis in one year. And then I immediately got medicine that was able to resolve all my severe uh, symptoms. And I was able to find medicine later on. It didn't give me any side effects. And because of this, I never experienced a major crisis, which I've been learning through more conversations is the more typical uh, story. Um, I've had support and grace from my family and friends and advisors and community at every possible juncture. Again, uh, that is not always very common. Um, there are so many things uh, that could have gone wrong, uh, that could have kept me from being here today. And I never experienced any of them, uh, largely because of all of you and largely because of my environment that I've been in. And I am just so, uh, so very thankful for them. Um, I hope that as medical progress continues and that mental health conversations like this one become more commonplace, that my journey will become less of an anomaly uh, so that everybody um, who has mental health issues um, like mine or otherwise can experience just the joy that I'm experiencing in front of you all right now.